476 AD, the once unchallenged master of the Mediterranean, the Roman Empire, has collapsed in the West. Its homeland, Italia, is left to an uncertain fate at the hands of those they deem barbarian usurpers. The Romans of the East, under their great emperor Justinian, would briefly reclaim Italy, but it wasn't long before their grip on the peninsula began to slip, and the land which had once given birth to a massive empire itself became the subject of the societies which arose from its ashes. Yet the world had not seen the last of what Italy had to offer. Far from it. Affairs in Italy were central to the development of medieval European history and beyond. Italy was a crossroads of Europe and the Mediterranean, where great empires clashed and cooperated. It was the center of the religion which would fundamentally shape European society, and it was Italy which first led Europe out of the Middle Ages into a period of cultural and intellectual rebirth known as the Renaissance. However, for most of their history, the Italians achieved what they did not as one people, but as many separate peoples divided into various polities. At times, some of these polities were forces to be reckoned with, but at others, Italy was dominated by neighboring powers. It was not until the mid-19th century that the Italians stepped onto the world stage as a united people. Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to Fire of Learning. This is the story of this remarkable country. Thank you for joining us as we now add Italy to our History of Nations and Peoples documentary series. Before we begin, I would like to thank Brian Conroy, Scott Opel, Lindsay Brubaker, Biohazard Gamer, Jace, Donna Posilico, Mark Torres, Tostios, Mark Borden, Dimitar, Chris Marlar, Victoria Kinnard, Ann Taylor, Michael Burns, Tony, and Big Guy for being my most recent supporters on Patreon. They join these supporters listed here who help to make videos like this possible. Now then, let's get to it. The history of the Roman Empire upon which the foundations of Italian society rest has already been covered in separate videos in this series, and so it will not be extensively covered here. However, a brief summary of its history is necessary to review. In the 3rd century BC, the Romans began to build an empire that would come to extend far outside their Italian homeland. When it reached its territorial zenith in the year 117 AD, it stretched from Britain to the Middle East and completely surrounded the Mediterranean Sea. The empire enjoyed unrivaled supremacy over its region of the earth and a golden age that lasted throughout most of the 1st and 2nd centuries AD. However, by the year 180 AD, with the death of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, things began to turn for Rome. It began to slowly descend, in the words of the Roman historian Cassius Dio, from a kingdom of gold to one of iron and rust. By 400 AD, the empire was but a shell of its former self, at least in the west. The empire had been divided in half and administered by separate emperors some time earlier, a consequence of its decreasing ability to govern itself. The eastern half of the empire, which is often referred to by historians as the Byzantine Empire, especially after the 6th century, would weather this tumultuous period and endure for another thousand years. The western empire, however, to which the Italian peninsula belonged, would not outlive the century. Slowly, piece by piece would be lost to invading peoples, the majority of whom hailed from a region the Romans called Germania, modern-day Germany. By the year 476 AD, the Western Roman Empire had retracted back into the Italian peninsula. It was in this year that Western Rome's final emperor, a boy by the name of Romulus Augustulus, little more than a puppet of his father, was deposed by the barbarian leader Odoacer. During Rome's final centuries, its military became increasingly composed of foreign mercenaries. Odoacer was one such mercenary. Little is known of his origins. He was likely Germanic and held officer status in the Roman military. Rome had seen its fair share of military coups by this point, most of them motivated by self-interest rather than any genuine attempt to fix the crumbling order, and it had been indirectly governed by barbarians before. Romulus Augustulus's father and puppet master Orestes was himself a barbarian, in fact. However, Odoacer ended the charade and dealt the final blow to Western Rome as a political entity. Upon seizing power, instead of proclaiming himself, or more likely a puppet emperor, he was simply proclaimed Rex Italiae, meaning King of Italy. The Western Roman Senate took the imperial insignia and sent them to Zeno, the Eastern Roman Emperor. 
the implication being that the West no longer had an emperor. This is why, even though there were still a few Roman rump states in existence, and Roman society in Italy would endure for a few centuries after this in many forms, historians mark 476 AD as the end of the Western Empire. Zeno accepted these circumstances and granted Odoacer the title Dux Italiae, Duke of Italy. Odoacer presented himself as a client ruler of the Eastern Emperor, but in actuality ruled over his domain, which consisted of not only mainland Italy, but a fair amount of territory to its east and part of Sicily, mostly independently. Sources from this time period, late antiquity and especially the early Middle Ages, are difficult to come by and often vague when available, but it appears Odoacer's rule was relatively successful and regarded with much approval. However, in the end, he overestimated his abilities. Odoacer would turn on Zeno later in his reign, and even invaded Eastern Rome. In response, Zeno summoned Theodoric, king of the Ostrogoths, and offered him a deal. If Theodoric agreed to invade Italy and eliminate Odoacer with the emperor's support, he could replace him as king of Italy. The Ostrogoths were a Germanic people at that point inhabiting a region in between these two powers, but in search of a more permanent homeland. They had been troublesome to Zeno in the past, and so his proposal was partly motivated by a desire to be rid of them as well. Theodoric agreed, and in 489, he led his people, who numbered perhaps 150,000, 25,000 of whom were warriors, to invade Italy. War waged for years, but by 493, Odoacer was clearly losing. He opted for diplomacy, and the two kings agreed to a treaty which held that they would rule Italy jointly. However, Odoacer was soon thereafter killed by Theodoric himself while they dined together at the banquet held in celebration of this treaty, evidently cutting him in two with his sword. This significantly dampened the mood of the party and altered the future of Italy. Theodoric became the sole king of Italy. Theodoric's rule was not only more successful than Odoacer's, but of all the Germanic rulers taking the places once held by Romans in this period, he is regarded as one of the most successful. In time, he would be known as Theodoric the Great. Like Odoacer, he would not be satisfied with ruling only Italy. Through both marriage and war, he extended his influence over each of his neighbors. For example, he waged war on the Burgundians and, naturally, Byzantium, and married his daughter to Alaric II, king of the Visigoths. To prevent confusion, the Ostro, meaning Eastern, and Visa, meaning Western, Goths, were descended from the same people, the Goths. However, they had diverged from each other a few centuries prior, and their sense of kinship was now limited, albeit not gone. In 507, when the Visigothic king Alaric II died in battle against the Franks, the Visigoths were left without a clear ruler. Alaric left behind only two heirs, an illegitimate son, Gesalec, and a child named Amalaric, who was Theodoric's grandson. Gesalec took control of the Visigothic realm, but Theodoric proclaimed himself his grandson's regent. When Gesalec proved inefficient, Theodoric was able to take control of the Visigothic kingdom himself in 511. He thus became master of a Gothic empire that, when his influence in other territories was included especially, quite resembled the Western Roman Empire. Indeed, though a proud Goth, Theodoric was a Roman emperor in all but name. He began to speak Latin, donned the imperial purple, and even held games in the Colosseum. Here we can see that though the Roman Empire had technically fallen in the West, even under Germanic rule, many aspects of Roman culture and society would persist for decades, some for centuries or even longer. Italy's Ostrogothic rulers would make it clear that their people were the ones in charge, even legally mandating a degree of separation between them and the Romans. For example, Romans and Ostrogoths could not marry, and the two peoples lived under separate legal systems. Though advantageous to maintaining power, this was not purely an Ostrogothic desire. The Romans preferred to retain their separate Roman way of life as well. However, at the same time, it must be said that the Ostrogoths took over Italy not by pushing Roman society to the side and placing themselves above it, but by integrating themselves into it and working with Roman officials to administer it. Although its power was substantially diminished, the Roman Senate continued functioning until 603 AD and played an important role in the reigns of Italy's early kings. The native people still consider themselves Romans. Modern Italian is a direct descendant of the language the Romans spoke. 
Another endearing aspect of Rome was Christianity, which the Romans had adopted in the 4th century AD. Christianity would not only play a fundamental role in Italian life throughout its history, but had a special presence in Italy in the form of the Pope, which will become more important later on. For now though, while most Roman Italians were essentially Catholics, its Germanic elites followed a non-Trinitarian form of Christianity called Arianism. Relations between these different Christian groups were generally peaceful, but even under Theodoric there were quarrels. Theodoric's relatively stable 33-year reign over Italy and abroad came to an end when he died in 526 AD. The Visigoths split from the Ostrogoths again and were never reunited. His Italian heirs would not live up to his accomplishments. He was succeeded by his ten-year-old grandson, Athalaric, with his daughter Amalasuintha serving as regent. Athalaric grew up to be a drunk who amounted to little and died in 534. His mother was more efficient, but the Ostrogothic nobles were concerned about her going native, so to speak, embracing Roman values and culture and even working with the Eastern Romans beyond what they were comfortable with. She was assassinated the following year, likely by agents working for her successor, who drowned her in Lake Bolsena while she bathed. The throne then went to Theodahad, Theodoric's middle-aged nephew who, apart from this bloody usurpation, was a docile, erudite man who generally preferred philosophy to ruling. Such kings may have their moments, but this was not one, for Italy was about to be invaded by a people known as the Romans. The throne of the Eastern Roman Empire had passed to an intelligent and dedicated man named Justinian I. The great ambition of his reign was the Renovatio Imperi Romanorum, the renewal of the Roman Empire. Simply put, he sought to reclaim the western lands that the Romans had lost to barbarian invaders. In 534, he and his leading general Belisarius had succeeded in overcoming the Vandal Kingdom in North Africa. Now, in 535, he turned his eye towards Italy, using his ally Amalasuintha's murder as a pretext for invasion. So began what are remembered as the Gothic Wars. Within the year, the Romans controlled Sicily and were pressing into the Ostrogothic Kingdom on two fronts. Fearful of defeat, Theodahad was murdered by his followers and replaced with Vitiges, Amalasuintha's son-in-law. Vitiges failed as well, however, and by the year 541 he had been taken prisoner, the Ostrogothic capital of Ravenna had been captured, and the Byzantine Romans controlled the majority of the Italian peninsula. The Romans, it appeared, could not be stopped. But just as Justinian was on the cusp of realizing his ambitions and making this period seem like only a hiccup in what would be the eternal reign of Rome, disaster struck. In 541 and 542, Belisarius was recalled from Italy, the Persians attacked the Byzantines in the east, and a horrendous plague known as the Plague of Justinian broke out in the empire. The plague affected the much more densely populated Byzantine Empire than Italy. It would eliminate roughly 40% of the Byzantine population in less than a decade and place Justinian himself in a coma. Rising to seize on the opportunity that had presented itself was Totila the king that the Ostrogoths had elected in 541. In 542, Totila began to reverse many of the Byzantine gains. In 544, however, Belisarius returned and began to push him back once again. The war would then drag on for years, with neither side managing to gain the upper hand. Violence and destruction became everyday affairs, and the peninsula was absolutely ravaged. Finally, in 552, a large Byzantine force arrived and began to reassert Roman control. Totila died at the Battle of Tagani that year. At the Battle of Mons Lactarius the year after, the Ostrogoths finally succumbed to the Romans. After this battle, the Ostrogoths, as a people, would fade into history. Though wars with other barbarians attempting to occupy the peninsula, namely the Franks, would continue, Italy was now once more a Roman territory. But this had come at great cost. Two decades of war alongside disease and famine had left the peninsula barren and impoverished. The great cities for which the Byzantines had striven were ruined and significantly depopulated. Many historians agree that these wars had a much harsher impact on Italy than the initial collapse of the empire. And after all that the Byzantines had sacrificed, only a decade later, Roman rule in Italy would be challenged again, this time 
by a people known as the people of the Longbeards, or the Lombards. The Lombards were a Germanic people who had remained outside of the Roman Empire during the West's collapse. During the reign of Justinian, they inhabited the region in between Italy and the Balkans, and had been used as mercenaries against Rome's foes, including the Ostrogoths. In 565, the Emperor Justinian died, and his successor, Justin II, became an enemy of the Lombards. In response to this, in 568, the Lombards, under their king Alboin, invaded Byzantine Italy. Italy was still devastated from war. The Lombards, backed by other tribal allies such as the Saxons and Heruli, swept through much of northern Italy, occupying the area north of the Po River and some south of it as well. They established their capital at Pavia by 572. That same year, however, King Alboin was assassinated. The Lombard dukes elected a new king, Clef, but he died two years later in 574. After this, the dukes would not elect another king for a decade, and so they simply did not have a central leader. The Lombards had organized the territories they conquered into duchies, subdivisions of their kingdom, each ruled by one of these dukes. In the absence of a king, each duke ruled their own territory independently. According to Paul the Deacon, there were more than 30 such duchies at the time. This situation allowed the dukes freedom to do as they pleased, but would hinder their collective expansion. It wasn't until 584, when the combined pressure of the Franks and Byzantines began to threaten them, that the Lombards finally elected a new king, a duke named Althari. Althari and his successor Agilolf waged war on these foes, as well as invaders who penetrated Italy from the east, namely the nomadic Pannonian Avars, and a people known as the Slavs. Neither the Byzantines nor Lombards were able to gain the upper hand over the other in their conflict. As a result, Italy would be divided in an awkward patchwork arrangement of territories between Lombards and Byzantine Romans for centuries. The Byzantines controlled a Z-shaped territory in the heart of the peninsula, which connected the cities of Rome and Ravenna. They also controlled Liguria in the northwest, Venetia in the northeast, the southern peninsulas at the boot of Italy of Calabria and Apulia, Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica, and had a tenuous hold on the city of Naples. The Lombards controlled the rest. However, within the Lombard Kingdom, even though they had once more united under a single king, divisions would persist between the duchies, and the dukes would retain a considerable amount of power. Ultimately, as the map of Italy would change throughout the centuries, with new powers rising and falling, Italy would be divided between separate political entities from this age all the way to the late 1800s. Technically, political divisions still exist. The region home to the various northern duchies would be referred to as Longobardia Maior, Longobardia Major. The southern duchies, consisting of the duchies of Spoleto and Benevento, which, largely because they were out of the reach of the Lombard kings, were basically independent throughout most of their existence, were called Longobardia Minor, or Minor. Like the Ostrogoths before them, the Lombards were a minority in the regions they ruled, comprising only around 10% of the population they would slowly integrate themselves into the existing culture. Time would Romanize them much more significantly than the short-lived Ostrogoths. They would begin to speak Latin by the 8th century, and absorbed many aspects of Roman culture and lifestyle. However, for the time being, the arrangement was also very similar to that of the Ostrogoths and Romans, in the sense that their kingdom was inhabited by what they considered two separate peoples in the same areas. However, again, this gap between them would close as time went on. While Italy was not heavily Germanicized by the Lombards, it is true that the traditional Roman order and identity faded under them, changing into the beginnings of what would become an Italian identity, or more properly, regional identities. King Agolo seems to have remained an Arian Christian throughout his rule of 590-616, to but his wife and children were Catholics. Generally, he was more tolerant of the Catholic majority than his predecessors, and maintained a friendly relationship with Pope Gregory the Great. Likewise, most Lombards were Arians, Pagans, or even something in between the two. But there was increasing interest among the Lombards in converting to Catholicism. However, this interest was not universal. The Lombards, including the succeeding monarchs, would oscillate between Catholicism and Arianism, which, when paired with political, legal, and cultural disagreements between them, would lead to civil wars. 
Although, truth be told, the Lombards needed little more than a succession dispute to enter into a civil war. It would be common for kings to be assassinated, overthrown, and otherwise have to fight to retain power. In 636, Rothari became king of the Lombards. He waged war on the Byzantines, conquering Liguria and northwestern Italy. In 663, during the reign of Grimwald I, the Byzantine Emperor Constans II decided to move his capital to Syracuse in Sicily. From there, he would invade the Duchy of Benevento. However, Grimwald, who also happened to be the Duke of Benevento, drove him back. In 671, the next Lombard king, Percterit, made Catholicism the official religion of the Lombards. Most Lombards would follow suit, but this hardly made their relationship with the Church in Rome perfect. Speaking of, throughout the 7th century, as all this occurred, the papacy, the Church in Rome, had been gaining prominence. The origins and development of the Christian Church would require its own video to properly explain. However, by this point in history, the Church had already become a powerful and influential organization in both the East and the West. However, there were important structural differences between the Eastern Church, centered in Constantinople, and the Western Church, centered in Rome, and they did not always act in unison. The Eastern Church was heavily influenced by the Byzantine Emperor. Meanwhile, the Western Church asserted more independence from the Emperor and other secular rulers, even arguing that they could contest them on spiritual matters, and that their authority was derived directly from God without secular rulers in between. The Roman Church's inability to rely on the Emperor in this region, which increasingly belonged to the barbarians, only heightened their sense of, and need for, independence. The Western Church was headed by the Bishop of Rome. Bishops were often called Papas. Greek for father, but ever since the reign of the highly influential figure of Leo I in the 5th century, the term increasingly became used to refer to the Bishop of Rome exclusively. From this word, we get the word Pope. In 712, Liutprand became king of the Lombards. Liutprand's long reign would be conflict-ridden, but generally successful. The most prominent of these conflicts revolved around exploiting the rising tensions between the Byzantines and papacy to further his own interests, but he waged war on his other neighbors as well, including a new player entering the theater, the Islamic Umayyad Caliphate. The century prior, the forces of this new religion had come out of the Arabian Peninsula like a tidal wave, building an empire that would stretch from Iberia to the borders of India. Their chief foe at the time remained the Byzantine Empire. The Caliphate enjoyed numerous victories against the Byzantines, and weakened them considerably, a situation which the Lombards were happy to take advantage of. However, there was also concern that they could conquer all of Italy, as they had Iberia, and so Liutfran would wage war on pirates from the Caliphate. In doing so, he was able to acquire the island of Corsica from the Byzantines by promising to protect it. Simultaneously, another new player began to quietly emerge in Italy as well. In 726, the people of a city surrounded by a lagoon in the northeast, called Venice, elected their own duke, or doge, for the first time. This would not yet mark total independence from the Byzantines to whom they had previously been loyal, but it was certainly on this route. In truth, they had been ever since Byzantium began to lose control of the region to the Lombards. Liutprand used the ongoing papal-Byzantine conflict to invade Byzantine territory with papal approval. Then, in 730, Liutprand switched sides when the Exarch of Ravenna promised to help him gain control of the southern Lombard duchies of Benevento and Spoleto in exchange for support against the Pope and the return of territory, an arrangement which, in spite of rebellions, was successful. Liutprand died in 744. He ruled over much more of Italy than any of his predecessors had, but his accomplishments would not long outlive him. His son, Hildeprand, was overthrown, and then the man who had overthrown Hildeprand was himself overthrown in 749 by Eistulf, the Duke of Friuli. Eistulf waged a remarkably successful war on the Byzantines, taking the whole of their northern Italian holdings apart from Venice. With such success, Eistulf then boldly proclaimed himself King of the Romans, and set his sights on the rest of Italy, by this point a completely realistic ambition. He then began to intimidate the papacy, threatening them and extracting tribute from them. With the Byzantines unlikely to rescue them, the Pope turned to a new ally, which was beginning to become intimidatingly powerful, the Franks, who ruled the region of, roughly, modern France. 
The Frankish king Pepin the Short answered the Pope's call for aid, and attacked the Lombards in 754 and again in 756. The Franks were victorious, and Pepin forced Isolf to relinquish the lands which once connected the Byzantine cities of Rome to Ravenna, and then granted them to the Pope. This act is recorded as the Donation of Pepin. It was a major event in early medieval history, as it established the Papal States under the Pope's authority. This would have substantial influence on the rest of Italian and European history. In 756, Eistulf died and was succeeded by Desiderius, an heir favored by the Pope and Franks. Their trust in him was misplaced. After concluding yet another fight to control the southern duchies in his favor, Desiderius turned on the Papal States, annexing several cities under their control. With the Lombards having become antagonistic yet again, Pope Hadrian called to the Franks for aid. Unfortunately for the Lombards, not only would the Franks respond, but the ruler who would lead them was one of, if not the most successful European ruler of the early Middle Ages. He is called Charlemagne. In 773, Charlemagne and his army crossed the Alps to invade the Lombard kingdom. After a siege of eight months, he captured their capital of Pavia. Desiderius was exiled, and the northern portion of the peninsula quickly fell to them. Charlemagne then assumed the title Rex Longobardorum, King of the Lombards, for himself, and added their kingdom to his domain. Thus began the rule of the Carolingians. Charlemagne was not a harsh conqueror, and allowed the Lombards to retain their laws, customs, and, if they proved obedient, positions. But he was master. This event marked the end of the independent Lombard kingdom of the north. However, while the Duchy of Spoleto was included in the territories obtained by Charlemagne, the Duchy of Benevento in the south was not. Charlemagne intimidated it, and the Duke, who now styled himself Princeps, or Prince, pledged loyalty to him as a result. But the Duchy still mostly retained its de facto independence nevertheless. Italy was one of Charlemagne's most significant conquests, but it was still one of many. His reign was only beginning. By 800 AD, Charlemagne ruled over a dominion that stretched from northeastern Iberia to what is today Hungary and Poland. It was on Christmas Day of that year that Pope Leo III crowned Charlemagne Imperator Romanorum, Emperor of the Romans. The title was one of great significance. This event was not exactly a resurrection of the Roman Empire of antiquity. By this point, the concept of the Roman Empire had come to mean the center of civilization and the one true empire of the earth, which worked in tandem with the one true church of the earth. Given that Charlemagne was master of such a large area of Christendom, he was perhaps more deserving of the title than any European ruler ever since the fall of the West, apart from the Romans. The Eastern Roman Empire took great offense to this and viewed it as a usurpation of their identity. The Byzantines were at a disadvantage, however. The Emperor of the East was a woman, Irene. She called herself Emperor, not Empress, but nevertheless, it was argued by the West that the title could only be held by a man. Thus, Charlemagne was proclaimed as the true Roman Emperor and successor to Irene's predecessor, Constantine VI. This was also a way for the Pope to establish his right to appoint emperors and more adamantly align himself with the West in the same stroke. The Byzantines ardently contested their claim to the title. War came between the two empires. The conflict over the title was only the issue on the surface of what was a struggle between two great empires for dominance. The war ended in a truce in 810. There was no change of territory in Italy. The Franks retained control of the majority, the Papal States ruled the center as vassals of the Franks, the Byzantines clung to their various coastal outposts, some of which continued becoming increasingly self-governed, and the Lombards persisted in Benevento. Charlemagne died in 814, and was succeeded by his son, Louis the Pious. Louis the Pious would not live up to his father's legacy. He was a weak ruler, better suited for the clergy than as a warrior emperor. As civil wars over succession rights between his heirs began well before he had died, it became clear that the empire was doomed to collapse upon his death. Meanwhile, other major events were taking place in Italy, many revolving around the continuously weakening grip of the Byzantines on the region. Across the sea, men from the various Islamic lands of Iberia, North Africa, and the Middle East, referred to in the Middle Ages as Saracens, were still trying their hand at seizing territory in Italy. 
Italy in this time was largely spared the threat of the Vikings, but Saracen raids had a largely equal effect. In 827, an Arab dynasty centered in what is today Tunisia, called the Aglabids, invaded the Byzantine island of Sicily. By the 840s, the Aglabids controlled most of the island, apart from the east, which remained Byzantine. The battle for the island would be a long one, but it was one which the Arabs were clearly winning. Foreign conquerors were not necessary for the Byzantines to lose territory in Italy, however. By 840 AD, though some allegiance to Byzantium was still held, both the cities of Naples and Venice began to act increasingly independently. Other city-states, such as Amalfi, Gaeta, and Sorrento, would become increasingly, if not totally independent around this time as well. The island of Sardinia, too, moved towards independence. The Sardinians were unable to rely on the distant emperor for protection, and were practically forced into self-sufficiency. By now, the Rome of antiquity was a memory. Byzantium was the Eastern Roman Empire. It had endured uninterrupted since its foundation, but it is true that the Byzantines were increasingly regarded by many Italians outside of their Italian holdings as a foreign Greek empire. Part of this was Frankish papal propaganda, but this distinction was not based on nothing. The Byzantines were, in fact, culturally and linguistically Greek by now, distinct from the people of Italy. In 840, the Saracens captured the city of Taranto, which they would retain for 40 years. In 846, Saracen pirates of uncertain origins attacked and looted the city of Rome itself. In 847, a separate group from North Africa conquered and held the city of Bari, founding an emirate there. Meanwhile, the Duchy of Benevento began to fracture. In 849, the Duchy of Salerno split off from Benevento following a civil war. Capua, then, would itself split off from Salerno in 861, dividing the Lombard South for centuries. Louis the Pious had inherited the whole of the Frankish Empire because he was Charlemagne's only surviving son. When he died in 840, the empire was, in accordance with Frankish tradition, divided among his sons. By 843, when the wars over who would control what ended, the brothers signed the Treaty of Verdun. Verdun parted the Frankish Empire into West Francia, which would lay the foundations for what would later develop into the Kingdom of France, East Francia, which laid the foundations for Germany, and Middle Francia. Middle Francia, placed under the rule of Lothair I, included territory that stretched from northern Italy to the lowlands. Lothair would inherit the title of emperor as well, though his power was relatively equal to his brothers. Upon Lothair's death in 855, Middle Francia was itself divided into three. Louis II the Younger inherited the former Italian kingdom of the Lombards. Up to this point, the Franks had, frankly, not paid much attention to their Italian domain. They largely neglected the territory in favor of their other lands, and ruled it in absentia, meaning the regional divisions that had formed under the Lombards were never truly broken down. Life in Carolingian Italy was not much different for the average person than Lombard Italy. Louis II, having been left with only Italy, would be much less negligent. Before his rule began, under his father he had become active in Italian politics, made war on the Saracens, and worked towards strengthening his domain and his control over Italy in numerous other ways. In 871, Louis and his allies captured the city of Bari. When it appeared he would attempt to secure greater control over southern Italy as a whole, however, the prince of Benevento imprisoned and robbed him. He was only released a month after when the threat of the Saracens returned, and he was required to defend Italy. Bari ended up in the hands of the Byzantines, who were focused on expanding their positions in Apulia and Calabria at this time. In 875, Louis II died without sons. His throne was eventually inherited by Charles the Fat, who was the king of East Francia. When Charles the Fat also inherited the throne of West Francia, this uninspiring and languid ruler, briefly, by chance, reunited the majority of the empire of his great-grandfather Charlemagne. The situation did not last long. In 887, he was deposed by Arnulf of Carinthia. The empire was divided once more, and would never again be reunited. After Arnulf's coup, Carolingian Italy was left without a clear king, and there was no clear heir to the title of emperor either. This marked the beginning of a darker period in northern Italian history, where civil war erupted between claimants to the throne. In 899, just as the civil wars seemed to be coming to a close, as Berengar I succeeded in claiming the throne of Italy, but not yet the title of emperor, 
disaster struck again. It was in this year that a new people hailing from the Eurasian steppes called the Magyars invaded Italy. King Berengar met them at the Battle of Berenta, but was defeated. It was a disaster for the Italians. Berengar's army was destroyed, opening the north to pillaging and destruction. In 900, Berengar secured a peace with the Magyars, but his initial failure against them caused some of his supporters to turn on him and find a new leader, Louis of Provence. This began a new round of civil war. Louis was even crowned emperor in 901, but in 905, Berengar defeated him and blinded him, emerging victorious once more as King of Italy. Yet the title of emperor, however, was again left vacant. Meanwhile, the Saracens continued to put pressure on the region. In 902, the conquest of Sicily was all but complete, with only a few Byzantine outposts remaining on the island. It was now the Imarat Sicilia, Emirate of Sicily. In 909, the island became ruled by the Fatimid Caliphate, who ruled it from Palermo, the most populous city in Italy and one of the most populous in all of Europe at the time. When the Aglabids, predecessors of the Fatimids, established an outpost in central Italy in 883, not far from Rome itself, the Pope increasingly began calling for unity against them. Unity was not as straightforward of an idea as one might think, as the Italians were fully engaged in competition with each other, and some powers, like Naples, were not against making alliances with Islamic powers against their Christian Italian foes. But eventually, a Catholic League would form. In 915, the Papal States, alongside the Byzantines and some of the southern Italian duchies, marched to capture the Fatimid fortress near the Garigliano River. Berengar did not participate in the Battle of Garigliano, but the Duchy of Spoleto acted in his name. The Catholic League was victorious. That same year, Pope John crowned Berengar Emperor. Berengar spent the rest of his reign battling Magyars and, once more, rivals for his crown. In 923, he was finally usurped by Rudolf II, King of Upper Burgundy, after the Battle of Firenzuola. Rudolf became King of Italy, but the title of Emperor once again became vacant in the West. In 926, Rudolf was himself replaced by Hugh of Arles, leader of Lower Burgundy. But then, in 945, he too was overthrown by Berengar of Ivrea, grandson of Berengar I. In this case, Hugh was allowed to keep the title of King, as was his son Lothair when he succeeded him in 947. But the real power was in Berengar of Ivrea's hands. When Lothair died in 950, he became King Berengar II. To bring legitimacy to his reign, which was not popular, Berengar II attempted to force Adelaide, who was King Lothair's widow and daughter of King Rudolf, to marry his son Adalbert. She refused and tried to flee, but was captured and imprisoned by King Berengar. In 951, after four months of imprisonment, Adelaide escaped and called for help from the King of East Francia. The king of that realm, Otto I, would answer her calls for aid, however, he would develop greater ambitions in Italy than simply her rescue. In September, King Otto crossed the Alps and invaded northern Italy. He faced little resistance. In fact, the northern Italian leaders and clergy often withdrew their support for Berengar II as soon as Otto arrived. Realizing this, Berengar fled from Pavia which surrendered to Otto without a fight. There, Otto was crowned King of Italy and married Adelaide. However, with the East Frankish army focused on other threats, namely the Vikings, the Magyars, and the Slavs, Otto was unable to completely subdue Berengar. Thus, a deal was struck in which Berengar would remain King of Italy, but would recognize Otto as his overlord. It wasn't long before Berengar betrayed this deal, however, attacking Otto's lands and the Papal States while the East Franks were distracted. In 961, once more, Otto marched into Italy to challenge Berengar, and, once more, easily overcame him. In 962, Pope John XII crowned Otto I Roman Emperor. His reception of the title Roman Emperor was significant. The title was once more held by someone with actual great power and influence in Christendom, unlike the past few recipients. While it is argued that the Holy Roman Empire began with Charlemagne, it was under Otto that the Holy Roman Empire, centered more in what is today Germany and Austria than Rome, 
would begin to take the form that would persist for centuries. The Holy Roman Empire now included much of what was once East Francia and Northern Italy. With Berengar defeated, however, Pope John began to become concerned by the rising power of Otto in Italy. He went so far as to contact Berengar's heir and Otto's other rivals in a plot to depose him. When Otto discovered this plot, 